my name is Jill Coyle and welcome to another episode of No One Dies From Divorce, where we talk the nitty gritty aspects of divorce and help each other come through this not only surviving, but thriving. I'm a divorce attorney and I'm interviewing other experts and people just like you who are going through or have been through a divorce so you can have the latest and greatest information on all things before, during, and after divorce. Let's dive in. Welcome to another episode of No One Dies From Divorce. This is my favorite episode of the month because we are talking about a celebrity divorce. And today's episode is about Kelly Clarkson. This divorce has obviously as a divorce attorney, it's so interesting. It's blown up on social media. There's been a ton of stuff on um, the news about it. And so uh, as much as I love Kelly and I actually respect her as a person um, and I I also have this tendency to want to respect her privacy as a divorce attorney. I'm like, uh, we just got to talk about this. Right, Luke? Abs- absolutely. So I am excited about my um, who came to help me with this episode because Luke Shaw is my number one. And when I say number one, he is my when I started Coil Law in 2014, Luke came and joined my ship in 2015 right? July of 2015. And he's been with me, um, ever since he's, so he's one of my senior, most trusted attorneys. He's also what I consider a really, really good friend. So welcome Luke. Thank you. I'm happy to join the team. Happy oh my to be gosh. a part of it. Oh my gosh. And I love this because this is so out of Luke's comfort zone and it's just going to be amazing. <laughs> I've become acclimated now that we have zoom hearings all the time right you're absolutely right we haven't been to court in what a year and a half now and it's looking like it will probably be to the end of the year so um just a little bit about luke so you know he was raised by an air force family and lived in primarily in spokane washington he served an lds mission in upstate new york he pursued an undergraduate degree in business management and then he went on to work for his brother's family law practice in Grand Rapids, Michigan, while working on his Juris Doctorate degree from Michigan State University College of Law. After graduation, he found himself in Arizona, where he joined the Arizona State Bar and married his wife. Yes, I technically <laughs> married her while I was living in Arizona, while she was in dental school. Yes. And then when she graduated dental school, you guys moved to Utah in 2015 and i got to benefit from that because you came and joined my firm and at the time it was just me and Sella, my my personal sister she's my legal assistant at the time and we were drowning we had so much work and luke just jumped right in and said all right let's go good times <laughs> good times and not only that when we first started um, this is a little fun fact. Um, I didn't even have an office for Luke. So he was down in the basement of this building that was not finished. And literally it was like a cement basement. Working right next to the hot water heater. Yes. It was, great. It was so great. You were such a trooper. Don't worry. Don't worry. I took care of him. When we finally bought our building in 2016, he got the best office. Um, and, and then you've kind of taken off. We actually haven't worked together like in the same office building for what, three years now? Yeah. About two years or so. Oh no. yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. Luke, Luke, um, we, we got another office down in Provo and eventually Pleasant Grove and Luke's been, um, down there. So, so leading that. And now he's helping me with all my other endeavors that I'm doing. So thanks Luke. Thanks for coming and talking about Kelly with me today. No problem. And I'm actually kind of excited about this and I wish we could get more actual legal documents on this case because there's so many reports coming out. It's hard to know what exactly is going on in the timeline of how things are happening. Right. Um, But there's so many interesting legal issues in this case and we're getting decisions, uh, reported decisions from the court. Um, Unfortunately, this stuff is all sealed by the state. um, So it's only leaks Right. That provide information. So we'll talk about what we can find that's been reported. But unfortunately, we don't have the actual documents um, from the court. Usually family law, especially in Utah, it's public record. Um, but a few years ago, they made it so they can't. it wasn't public to get any document. But they still made it to where you could get orders. Um, 
and and that was public and that's still as it is um with with California and usually you can go to family law hearings because they're public as well but what we think is with covid because they're all online it's impossible for you to kind of become part of the hearing because you have to have a link or permission to enter and so you also have to know when yeah and we think that's why Kelly, um, usually California um, documents are, at least their dockets are public record and you're able to find those and get a little bit more information. But we think that Kelly has sealed it or they've made it so that they can't do that, um, which makes sense. I mean, she's a public figure. Her divorce is like everywhere. Um, it would make sense that you'd want to keep a little bit of that private. Well, and I think one of the reasons that she hired her attorney, um, Laura Wasser. She's known for discretion and strategically um, filing or doing things to prevent more publicity of the divorce. Right. When I started researching this um, with Luke, I actually ended up doing a lot of research on this attorney, Laura. I, I hope to meet her one day. She, she's she got um, a lot of, I think... Um, drive and she's doing a lot of cool things in the profession that um I kind of fall in line with but she's she's obviously well respected in Hollywood cuz she has represented some big names so very Kelly. big very big names and, and you know she, Kelly Clarkson's just the most recent yeah we did find out that her dad was a family law prolific family law attorney and she kind of followed in his first steps i that is one thing that i didn't get the benefit of if i started my own business in my own so, but, but here she, here we are. So let's talk a little bit about Kelly because it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very interesting subject. So her spouse. Yeah. Do you want to give some background on the marriage and who, who she's married to? Yeah, absolutely. People want to know. Go ahead. So she got married, um, back in 2013 to Brandon Blackstock and he is a talent manager. Although uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and what he wants Again, to do with, with a father his life. that did the same thing and owned a company and he kind of followed in his path. So Kelly Clarkson was actually represented by, um, I believe, his dad's um, talent agency um, at one point. I don't know if that predated the marriage. But... Well, even um, just so you know that they met at a Super Bowl in like 2006 and um, they, they that was the first time they met. But he was married. Um, at the time, and it actually was married up until 2012. Yes, and he had two kids with yeah. the previous marriage. Yeah. Um, him and Kelly Clarkson got married. Um, they had two kids during their marriage, uh, so they now have four. And apparently that was one of the issues that caused the divorce, is she wanted more kids. And he's like, no, nah, I'm done. Uh, so there was some discontent. Uh, and it really happened, so she filed in June of 2020, Apparently on the heels of quarantining with her family in Montana. At yeah, the the, there's Montana. lots of reports to talk that quarantine was kind of the nail that, that sealed the coffin or whatever it was. It, it, it kind of seems like COVID, this is an example of uh, where COVID really kind of put the writing on the wall that this marriage wasn't going to last. Well, if you kind of read between the lines, and this is complete conjecture on my part, but if you look at kind of some things that have happened during uh, the divorce, kind of what they are saying they want to do moving forward, it, it makes a little bit more sense because her husband is now saying to the court and the court has reported this, or at least uh, he testified in court that he wants to be a rancher full time. He wants to quit being a talent manager. He wants to be a full time rancher. Which, by the way, I don't believe that at all. I think he just doesn't have any clients, and so he pivoted. And me and Luke see this all the time when people in a divorce autumn all of a sudden lose their job or, oh, I had to take a pay cut at, jo at work, and it's totally a, a strategic thing. But Well, and I, I don't know. I don't know if during quarantine he said, look, this is what I want to do. This is this is my dream. This is what I want to do. And she's like, what, what? I don't think so because he had a client. He had Blake Shelton as his main client up until just a few weeks ago. But so he, he was a, still doing. But he had a dwindling client list. He wasn't actively seeking new clients. So I don't know. I'm not gonna. I'm not here to judge the validity of his testimony <laughs> and what he wants to do. Oh, I am. Uh, I, I want to be salacious. Th like that's that. that's the judge's job. 
but that's what that's his representation to the court. That's his intent. That's what he wants to do, um, which is part of the reason for this temporary order that the court issued like a month ago, saying that. Well, let's well, let's let's stop there. Let's not talk about the temporary order because I want to kind of give a little bit more background to sure. this. First of all, Brandon's father is Narvel Blackstock, and he is again a prolific manager of the singers of country singers, and he. Um, started a business and or a, an agency that represented a lot of talent. And he, in fact, was married to Reba from 1989 to 2015. Reba McIntyre. Reba McIntyre. Yeah, sorry. Um, and um, and so, you know, Brandon was grown, grew up in this. Um, you know, he this is all he kind of knew. And clearly his dad's reputation allowed him to get some of the biggest names in um, the music business. I mean, in 2006, when um, Kelly Clarkston first met him, he was the manager for Rascal Flats. I mean, so this guy knew, you know, had the connections and was getting some really great talent to manage. And then, then we know that he managed um, Blake Shelton up until just recently for his entire career. And, you know, Blake Shelton was like 2001. You know, he's been big for a long time so he definitely definitely you know can't be said that he isn't good at what he does or he doesn't have the connections to be able to to manage talent i i, I don't know that that's true well I, I i'm gonna just speculate that the divorce is what's got tainted his ability to possibly get more clients because people are choosing kelly clarkson's side and again we don't know why we we don't want to we don't we don't necessarily know exactly what was in the marriage that caused the divorce. Uh, that that's true. That's true. Well, we don't really know other than it seems that they have different priorities um what they want to do moving forward. So, and it doesn't really matter, right? Watch Kona. <laughs> it's all right. But it doesn't ultimately really matter, right? It's irreconcilable differences. They're going to go their own ways. The marriage is over. That's fine. Um so how are we getting out of this marriage? Well, and that's that's the divorce, right? right. So, and that's a, that's exactly right. <clears throat> As divorce attorneys, Luke and I would say is that at the end of the day, the reason for the divorce is not going to be the issue that we need to focus on. A lot of people want it to be the issue, and a lot of people want us to focus on it. But at the end of the day, it's not going to change the end result. So we need to get past that. We need to be really looking at the matter of fact of this is what you need to be doing to protect yourself, your future, and your family. And that's what is like been absolute fascinating about this case and it does have it does have a little bit of relevance in this case specifically because we have to look at his income what he can earn what he's going to earn in the future and the property because the ranch in montana is kind of a hot topic in well, this divorce well let's okay so let's just talk a, talk a little bit kelly clarkson you, we all know who she is she came from um um american idol and she is just like had just an amazing career um several albums grammys um she now uh, is a judge on the the view or sorry the voice um which she is hilarious i love her and she and then she's now a prolific um talk show host and not only that starting next year she now has ellen degeneres's slot when ellen's show retires and i mean she is in the pinnacle of her career um and and so we're going to talk about that because because one of the things we do know is that there was a prenup there was a prenup and we don't know what the prenup says but we are going to assume as divorce attorneys that the prenup said that any premarital monies that were either of the parties were going to kept be kept premarital um and we now know that it also had to have some kind of provision that says if they earned money during the marriage and they bought property, that it was also protected within the prenup as well. The reason why we know this, and you can tell people, what, what, why do we know that now? So, well, and I think we need to talk about the temporary order a little bit. Okay. Uh, because that makes it even more relevant. So uh, we'll take it back a little bit to the to the temporary order. Um, there was an order back in, I believe, November of 2020 or something indicating that the kids were going to stay in California. That was the first order that we're so, aware of. So let me just explain that. What was interesting about that, first of all, it's very, very common for people to have to file t 
a request for temporary orders and a divorce so that they can have some kind of order or something, you know, talking about money and the children during the pendency of the divorce. So that's not um, surprising at all that um, Kelly Clarkson, her Blake Sox um, attorney, filed for a motion for temporary orders. What's interesting is, is in this temporary order, there was a fight for custody because um, Brandon was arguing that the children should live in Montana on the ranch and go to school up there. So basically he was arguing that he should have custody and Kelly clearly who her job um, is in LA was like, no, the children need to stay here. This is where their schools are. This is where their friends, their family are. And this is where, um, you know, they, they have primarily resided. And what was interesting about that argument, if you remember, is that Brandon made an argument that, um, the Montana house had primarily been the kids residence. I think the only reason he could make such an argument is that's where they were in quarantine. So it's like over the last six months since quarantine, they've been there. And I, I don't think that that's compelling. Yeah, honestly. And I don't know why his attorneys might have thought that would have actually been compelling to a court. But, you know, especially when their mom has a job that is impossible for her to leave the job um, to go to Montana to be around her kids. He doesn't have a job if you know, and it's it's hard to, you know, armchair quarterback their legal arguments. But honestly, he might have been able to argue that California wasn't their home state anymore. It could have been a jurisdictional argument. Yeah. Well, but whatever he argued, again, we don't have that. The plea. We don't. We don't know. But it we doesn't do matter. Know ultimately, the result. We, yeah, we, do, we don't know. It doesn't really matter. And we do know the result. She she was granted that the children were going to reside in California and that they were going to split joint legal, joint physical custody, and he was going to have to come to L.A. to live in their third home. They have three <laughs> that we know. Which is which is odd and weird but that's you know the privileges of money right Right. um so that happened actually from what i can understand pretty early and then last month we got this news of a temporary order indicating that she had to pay him temporary spousal support and temporary child support of about two hundred thousand dollars it's about fifty thousand dollars in child support and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in spousal support and there was a lot of reaction to this and Everyone's like flabbergasted by the number, which it's a lot of money. That's that's far more than what the average household will earn in a year in most states. So, but yeah, you have to look at how much she makes. So she was making like one point four to one point eight million a month. Yeah. Uh, so well, she was make she's uh, net worth was about thirty million dollars. Her annual salary was about. Fourteen million just from the voice. I mean, she was getting four five hundred sixty thousand per episode. Her current was just over nineteen million annually, or one point five million monthly. So, so she she's making good money. She's making a lot. This isn't really this isn't much of a dent, right, in her income, right. honestly. I think I think why, <clears throat> and this is where me and Luke like this is perfect for us because we talk about the dynamic about uh, the the difference if it's because are we mad that she's having to pay this person who could possibly be working and earning his own money, or are we mad because she's a woman and she's having to pay the man? Because I promise you, if this was flipped and Brandon was the one making all this money, Kelly would be entitled to this and nobody would blink an eye. Yeah, if, well, I guess Blake is a bad example because he has a famous wife, too, that makes a lot of money. <laughs> uh, you know, and actually all of the voice contestants have famous spouses that make a lot of money, it right. seems. But you're right. If this were a male celebrity and, you know, he married someone, you know, it could be Steph Curry and Aisha Curry honestly and he had to pay her this money they'd be like good for her right good for you getting some money like she deserves it she supported him you know in his career and she deserves at least that right he she should probably get half of it honestly and that's probably the sentiment we would hear but this guy is going to be raked over the coals you know labeled as a bum and i have my own opinion about this whole position that he wants to be a rancher and change his lifestyle I don't think that he should be able to do that on her dime, per se. But at the same time, the law is the law. And if the law entitles him to some need for some temporary support, 
That's the law. And so a lot of people uh, have asked the question, well, if she has a prenup, which by the way, the prenup was just upheld in court. Like he challenged it. He wanted to try to set it aside. It was upheld. But so a lot of people are wondering, well, if there's a prenuptial agreement, why is he having to pay her temporary support? And I just wanted to point that out, that actually a prenuptial agreement usually deals with the um, after effects of a divorce. Actually, the divorce effectuates what's actually going to happen in the contract of the prenuptial agreement. It usually, though, cannot stop from some kind of temporary support during the pendency of the divorce, um, unless it's probably specifically written in. But in Utah specifically, even if you say I, you know, as a in the prenuptial agreement, I waive any future alimony, um, you can still um, have grounds to come to court and ask for some temporary support. So my assumption is, is that's exactly what's happening, that this, it was labeled temporary support. It was backdated till when, like April, um, and that it's only going to last until the parties can get to trial to then um, litigate the remainder of their marital estate. Well, yeah, and I don't know that the court determining that the prenuptial agreement was valid is the end of the story here. Because that doesn't mean that they agree on what the provisions of that prenup right. mean or how it applies to their marriage or their assets. Uh, the only thing that we really know or has been reported on is this ranch in Montana because that's where Brandon lives. That's where he intended to reside. But the reports are indicating that that property is now hers. It's been deemed to be her separate property. So now what's she going to do with it? Does she have the right to sell it under him and say, you're out, I'm going to evict you, you're gone, mm -hmm. um, which actually might actually not be so bad for him because the court also reportedly said he had to pay for all the expenses on the property. So long as he lives there. So long as he, he lives can. there, which is $81,000 a month, right? which is a, a big chunk of that $200,000 yeah. that she's supposed to pay him every month. So- I don't know. He may want to leave and start, you know, just taking that money because I don't know how much he's actually earning. Right. Uh, what the report that I saw is he was earning like nine thousand dollars a month, which is, you know, pocket change. Right. So, so you were correct on the the temporary spousal support. He, she has to pay one hundred fifty thousand dollars. She has to pay forty five thousand six hundred in month in child support. Um. She also had to pay $1.25 million in attorney fees, um, which, you know, that's common. If you have one higher earner, um, uh, sometimes the court will allow a, like a fronting of fees so that the other person can then litigate their case. Um, it didn't it didn't surprise me, I guess, that the court said that, except it did surprise me because it's so much, Luke. I, it's so I, much money. It's so much money. I don't I, make that much money. Do I, you make that much I money? I cannot. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I, I'm happy to, you know, take that money if you want to pay me that. But uh, yeah, I can't even fathom how in 18 months they could have racked up $1.25 million in attorney's fees or even projected that that's how much they would spend over the course of the litigation because we don't really know if that was a, an upfront payment or what he's already done we right. don't we don't we don't know the ins and outs of that but but even still 1.25 million in a domestic law case seems crazy to me especially because they've only gotten through temporary orders <clears throat> And so I guess 1.25 million to get through trial. I mean, I mean, Luke and I were trying to do the math. We know what we hourly bill. Um, these attorneys usually are doing the same. They're hourly billing. So, you know, we know how much work is put into a family law case just because it's Kelly Clarkson. It's not going to be much different. We do actually very, very high net worth asset cases at our firm that take a lot of our time, a lot of our energy. And we have to spend a lot of time because there's multiple assets. Um, they might just not be famous. Um, and and we were trying to rack up how many hours we would have to bill if we were to take an L.A. hourly rate. And we still were like, oh, my gosh, that's so much money. <laughs> we just we don't understand it. But 
But the court granted it. He got $1.25 million in attorney fees. I mean, if I was Brandon, I'd be like, let's settle. And I just want to keep the money because <laughs> he's not going to get probably that much money even out of the settlement. Oh, yeah. Who knows? It's, who knows? It's, it's, it's hard to know. And I'm sure she just doesn't want to pay him to go away. But the other thing that I we see a lot in family law cases and I think is lost on a lot of people. The other consideration Kelly Clarkson has or any famous or well-known person in the public eye is she also has her children who are going to spend a considerable amount of time with Brandon Blackstock. I don't know how long he's going to be doing parent time in this other residence. I, I imagine he's going to want to establish his own residence, maybe elsewhere, but if he doesn't have money to buy a house that, you know, is akin to kind of what they're used to or where they have been living, that puts the kids in a more precarious position. Uh, you know, what kind of security does she want for her kids in his care? Like, and how much is she willing to pay in order to secure that for her children? Right. Not just the dad of her kids. And right. it, this, again, is going to be something that's looked at, you know, in other famous people's cases. You know, where they, the dad had, makes a lot of money and mom, like, he may have to pay her $50,000 a month in child support. And, you know, she may live off that. And that's just the reality of it. But it's not necessarily for her. It's for the kids. And she's the benefactor. Um, you know, one thing that Jill often says to clients or says to people in general is, you know, you can pick your spouse. You can't pick your ex-spouse. Mm -hmm. Uh this is a decision that they made, and we don't anticipate people going to marriage expecting this is going to happen, but this is the reality of divorce. And the hard thing about divorce is there's a lot of conflict in the process with not a lot of good perspective on what's going to happen outside of the divorce. Right. Because the divorce- We get tunnel vision because yeah. we're, just, we're just trying to take- the, d figure out what we're going to do for the next step and unfortunately it, it hurts well and this is the one thing that you know divorce trains it's not good for our longevity or business to tell people that they should settle or have a look at the bigger picture and be agreeable or try and work through things in an amicable way so that you can move forward um, and that's that's an important thing when you've got kids, especially here where the kids are very young. They're like five and seven, something like that. They're going to be dealing with co-parenting issues for a long time, right? for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they still are going to have to be involved with each other in the kids' lives for the kids' sake, you know, for the entirety of their lives. Um, you know, you would hope so for the kids' right. sake. But, you know, money is money. And Kelly Clarkson's going to make a lot of money. Right. So, you know, reports that she celebrated over this legal victory on the prenup. Um, I, I don't know that that's such good press from my perspective. Um, and I think they would be better suited to kind of keep that under wraps. I bit. think I think the biggest thing with Kelly, I think she and and I like how we're kind of playing this, <laughs> this, you know, support her, support him kind of. Because I think from Kelly's perspective, she's been really frustrated with how hard he's been fighting her. Um, usually high net worth cases like this are able to um, resolve themselves outside of court, um, especially because they don't want the press. And Brandon's now brought her to court three times, challenging where the children live. Um, that would frustrate me challenging on how much money you should be giving me right now. And then also now challenging the prenup. I mean, I I'm on team Kelly. I think I, that is frustrating and, and yeah, it's, it's blown this up to be in the press and, and it's put her in a position where she's had to fight and that's frustrating. One of the, I, I love because we, going back to, um, you know, the disparity, disparity of the incomes for both of the parties it, it is interesting because the whole purpose of alimony, and I looked this up, California is the same thing, is it's a, to allow you to live some semblance inside the marriage, outside the marriage. They don't want one person to go from the poorhouse to the, to the you know, the penthouse. Go from the penthouse to yeah. the poorhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And in this situation, we're kind of seeing that because if they did sign a really good prenup and she gets to take all her money and he's not making money, you know, they live in Malibu. I mean, I, the cheapest house in Malibu is going to cost you, you know, several million dollars. Like, so I, I see how there is that kind of problem of, well, how do you make it so that these kids have some semblance of the same set of circumstances in both homes? Because clearly if one parent has so much more money, you know, it's always going to be where the kids kind of want to go. So, but Brandon has the capability of making a lot of money. And actually, he has a Wikipedia page. We probably should find out what's his net worth because. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm like rooting for Brandon Blackstock. I'm not on anyone's team. Uh, oh come on, it's more fun that way. <laughs> I'm not on anyone's team. I just, it's interesting, and it, there were reports that he, you know, is holding out or whatever. And I, I mean, don't know the truth of those. They're saying his net worth is about ten million dollars. So, I mean, that's what Google's saying. We got got to love the Google. But how I far mean, is that going to go in Malibu? Exactly. It, it won't even buy a house. So if you're buying a thirty five million dollar home, I don't I completely agree that there there needs to be a discussion on what can he earn? What is his ability to earn? Well, tell the tell them everybody what the judge said. Uh, I have it right here. I guess I can read it. So in this hearing, the judge specifically found we 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 at least got this um, part of piece of it where she said the evidence in this case shows that after the data separation respondent made a very deliberate choice to change his life and become a rancher full time the judge wrote in the court documents filed on Friday August 6th he testified that he is not now devoting any oh not devoting any effort toward expanding his client list and music management business respondent has made a very deliberate choice that that he testified he planned for a long time to significantly change his lifestyle from primary working in the music and entertainment industry to working in an agricultural community and lifestyle involved in full-time ranch and cattle work. Like I said, in divorce, we see this a lot. And I'm just telling you, the divorce is not the opportunity to decide that you are going to completely change your career path because it's probably going to backfire on you. It's The yeah. court's going to say, go get a job. I agree. But at the same time, regardless of what he is able to earn, it's not going to hold a candle to what she can earn. Oh, I absolutely uh, agree with that. But it's definitely the reason why they can't have more of an equal sharing of lifestyle because he's choosing not to work. Sure. The, the other kind of thing that creates some question in your mind when like reading this and if this is his position he wants to live the agricultural lifestyle but he also wants to have a joint physical custody um parent time schedule which is an impossibility you can't have joint custody if you're going to live in montana unless, in yeah unless he's actively on a regular basis you know 40 percent of the, his time is spent in california how is he going to be a full-time rancher and have that kind of parent time it it just doesn't make any sense so I don't know. I don't wanna, know how they're gonna do it. Why would you want to become a full time rancher that's costing you eighty one thousand dollars a month to run? I mean, we haven't heard any evidence that the ranch is making money. No, well, and I mean, maybe that's his plan. <laughs> but <laughs> the the report said he wanted to sponsor rodeos. Well, I don't know if that's gonna actually generate money or not. If he's producing these, if he's selling ad space. At, them if he's you know doing tv deals for the rights i don't know how he anticipates in making this money uh but you know there's a reason that small ranches haven't been viable um you know in more recent years i don't have any you know good facts to back that up but that's the sentiment that i've you know received or by watching yellowstone yeah, well, and in my experience, when we've gone to court and there's been a person that has chosen, like, we've gotten where, oh, I quit my job because I'm starting my own business. And now I'm making significantly less. Therefore, I have to pay less child support and alimony. And the court looks at him and says, it's not a good time to start your business. You got to pay your support. So go and get a job if, or I'm going to impute you to a higher wage. Um, I think that's a little bit of what the court did here. They did give him spousal support. He is going to get it for about two years. Now, California seems like they have a, a similar loss to Utah where, you know, you can um, in Utah, you can get alimony up to the length of the marriage. Um, but in, um, you know, short, shorter marriages or um, in, um, you know, the the more 
I don't want to say standard, but practice has just shown that half the length of marriages seems to be what. Well, what's interesting here, well, and kind of that point, that's in a final decree. Um, that's how we see it. But on a temporary basis, which is what this is, it could go on forever, uh, at least in Utah. If they just sit on the temporary order and never finalize it, that's going to last for as long as it goes. Um with this specifically, I think it's in the temporary order that the judge said, look, this order is going to last for two years on a temporary basis until you guys finalize this. So, but after two years, it, this is done on a temporary basis. If you haven't resolved your divorce, if we haven't finished this, it's done. Or you can motion the court for more time right. for the, on a temporary basis. Right. But I actually wish Utah would do this more and say, hey, look, I'm going to give you this much time on this temporary order. You get. You need to figure it right. out. Right. Well, I've seen. I've seen in my career where people have dragged out cases because their temporary support award is great, and they they they're good to go on that. And so we drag out. And the average time it takes for a Utah case to actually get to trial is three years. I mean, so you know, if you have a four year marriage and you drag out your you know divorce three years, you're going to get more alimony than you would ever get if you actually got to trial and I, I feel like in this case the judge was aware of that that there is major disputes in this case and therefore she was like all right this is it this is what you get you know try to resolve your case before then yeah and i don't know where they're uh, on settlement talks i don't know what they're gonna do and we've never heard that they've gone to mediation yet no, and I don't know that we ever will. Yeah. Uh, they may have, they may not. I'm sure they're constantly in settlement discussions. And it'll be interesting to see when this resolves, whether or not the prenup just fuels the fire of litigation or it kind of greases the wheels of settlement. I, I don't know. <laughs> that has yet to be seen. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know. I would like to know what's in all of these orders. I would like to know what's in the prenup. Anyone that could get a hold of it could probably make a lot of money. <laughs> um but TMZ, it, they pay big bucks. Yeah, I, this would be very interesting um, instead of the tidbits yeah. that we get. And, you know, obviously us having some background can kind of get an idea of what's probably going on. Um, and the public only hears what is being released by media sources. Right. So who knows what's actually going on? Right. Um, we can just kind of guess. And the thing is about this is that there's been such an uproar and me and Luke have talked about this. And again, we alluded to it earlier about how we just is the uproar over because Kelly's a woman and she's having to pay. But this is what I see a lot of this. And in, in my cases, I, I represent some very high powered or very high earner women. And and the, the feelings of why should I have to pay him I, I do t tend to see a little bit more of a, a thinking shift, wh whether it's the man or the woman. But this is what I tell all my women. If you have to pay alimony to your spouse, good for you. Like, that's awesome. You're a kick-ass woman. You are taking care of business. This is, should not be something that frustrates you or makes you anger. And, and this is just what I want to tell Kelly. Like, Kelly, good for you like this is awesome she's she's kicking butt in every aspect of her life i mean i love her story she came she was a waitress in houston texas when she came on american idol and she just blew everybody you know away with her talents and and from what i see i don't know her personally but she looks just like a pretty cool person and she definitely seems like someone who you know wears their emotion on their sleeve and what's interesting and i don't i don't know if your listeners listen to your podcast with your husband uh, who is a doctor. He's he's a great man. You know, he does well. He's, you know, accomplished a lot of his dreams. And he and I are similarly situated. And both of us are married to driven women who ultimately make more than we do. <laughs> uh, so we're both kind of in a similar position with Brandon Blackstock, not to say that we want to be ranchers, but, you know, we we are not what you would call traditionally the primary breadwinners in our household. Uh, so I, I can kind of see both sides of this and it, I certainly don't think that that makes me or Ryan, you know, most people would look at a doctor and a lawyer and be like, oh, you guys are doing, you guys are doing well. Um, you know, and it just so happens that we married up, 
you know, and it, it doesn't make us terrible or bad or, you know, it doesn't change the law either. And I agree with you, you know, good for Kelly Clarkson. You know, she should go Absolutely. out and make as much as she can. And, you know, whatever the court decides, whatever they can agree on, I hope they can agree on something that benefits their kids and that helps shelter their kids from, you know, a shattered marriage. Yeah. Uh, because that's really what matters most is what happens with these kids. And that was a decision that they made together. And it's something that they're going to have to continue to do together. Uh, so hopefully it doesn't go really bitter um, and cause problems for the kids uh, because they deserve better. Yeah, I agree. And that's the unfortunate thing is all the animosity and the hard feelings that are happening in the divorce. You know, eventually, hopefully they're able to move past that. They're able to just, you know, realize that they're going to have to co-parent whether they like it or not, and they're going to have to get along and they're going to have to share custody of their kids and, and their kids deserve both of them in their life. And, um, and so whatever's going on with the money wise, you know, they, um, they're both going to be big parts of their kids. Yeah. I kind of laugh because I'm like, who's going to, are they going to have to split 50, 50 for college, 50, 50 for weddings? And I'm like, no, oh, that's so funny. no, I, I think that's going to be squarely in Kelly. I hope, and I, I mean, you would hope just because she makes so, such significant amounts more, but you know, in traditional divorces, it's like, no, 50, 50, you know? Well, you know, it, the court can't order it. So it's, yeah. it's whoever's going to do it. Whatever but, they're going to do. Uh, yeah. And, It'll be interesting to see what happens with these kids over the long term. Hopefully, you know, we don't have to hear about them very much, not because they don't matter, but simply because they don't need the public to yeah. care um, unless they want us to. And then it may, we'll probably see them. But, you know, hopefully that they don't have to be in the public eye simply because their parents made a decision. Yeah, I um, agree. I just want Kelly to hear me if she's reading this or Brandon, if he's reading, if he's listening, read my book. Um, no one dies from divorce. You guys are going to be okay from this. Sorry that you're so publicly out there, but, um, you know, the way you guys handle will actually affect other people. And you could use this as an opportunity for people to learn and, and grow from and, and, and your kids are going to be okay. So long as you guys can, you know, kind of put the big boy pants on and, and make a, workable relationship or co-parenting relationship that benefits them. So we will see what happens. Yes, we will. Anyways, I'm so excited. That was a great episode. Kelly, Brandon, good luck. It's interesting. Well, I would not be surprised if their divorce kind of silently settles and we well, hear that yeah. it's done. I That would be best. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us for another episode. And um, until next week, you can always pick my book up. Remember, it's at local bookstores here in Utah. Support local. Or if you're not in Utah, we're on Amazon. Easiest place to buy. So um, thanks. Thanks for supporting us. Remember, click that plus, subscribe, watch, tell your friends. Till next time. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed, please subscribe, follow, and share. I'd love to hear your questions and feedback. You can contact me at community at jillcoyle.com. See you next time. I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. Any advice given on the podcast is general and shall not be construed as legal advice.